Hi, I'm Al Adamson. We're here again in Lincoln Hall, and this time I'm with Chris Mason, longtime friend, colleague, and inspiration. Chris, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. That's kind of you to say you're also an inspiration. The work we're doing together is very exciting. Well, thanks, Chris. Well, you have been instrumental. Let's just start off right at the bat. I mean, people data for good is something that is really important to both of us. And people analysts can be esoteric. When we talk about the future of work, it can be confusing. Why does it matter now? Mm -hmm. But you have taken this and kind of made it your mission. I mean, you've built your priorities around this notion of people data for good. So can you share what it means to you and why you've made such a commitment to it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, doing things for the good of, of people, the good for the planet, hopefully something that many of us can get behind. But uh, I can I have to give some credit for kind of clarifying that focus to uh, the work that the B Corp movement has done. Yeah. Very similar to the conscious capitalism movement, I think, as well. There's, there's a lot of overlap there in their thinking. B Corp probably influenced me the most because I worked at a company called Patagonia. So I'm not familiar. Was, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're wearing one of that, uh, that <laughs> great company's that great product. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's a wonderful coalescing around this idea that you can use business for good, right? Mm -hmm. And then taking it further, they, they did a ton of great work um, through a company called B Labs mm -hmm. in figuring out, well, how do we actually measure this stuff and certify people and all those kinds of things? So it's, it's it, first, I'm inspired by the idea and the, the, you know, kind of the grandeur of that idea, but also equally, uh, you know, kind of inspired and emboldened by the fact that some people have gone out there to start thinking about what this looks like. Mm -hmm. And of course, part of using business for good is thinking about how is it uh, serving the good of the people who work for that business, right? Yep. And as a human resource professional and a, and a data analytics geek, you know, yeah. wow, that's a great way to kind of bring all these things together. And so, yes, absolutely, why do this work if you're not doing it for a little more than just, you know, the profit? Well, you know, from a principal standpoint, I imagine listeners, whether they be a business leader or HR professional or like, you know, right on, right on. But we got to make some money. We have shareholders. We got all this. But so it's not just about making employees happy for the mm -hmm. sake of being happy. Mm -hmm. There are some business outcomes that, you know, financial results being among them that mm -hmm. ensue too. So it, it's a balance for you, yes? Absolutely a balance. And, and there I can take some inspiration from the current company I work with is a company called Kehi. And Kehi is a food distribution company. Um, we primarily focus on the uh, grocery business and uh, particularly in the specialty organic and natural food product space. So if uh -huh. you go into a grocery store and you go into the organic section, most likely you'll find some of the foods we distribute. And it's, you know, any kind of the healthy granola bars you might know. And you know we can we can name and think of many of those brands. Um, so we focus a lot on that space. We care about what food does to people and the goodness of food. Um, and so, uh, Kehi, most more recently than Patagonia, but only a few years ago now, became a B Corp as well, and yeah. said we're inspired by this idea of using business for a force as a force for good. But to your point folks at Kehi also said, well, you know, you got you to do it for the good of the business as well. And so there's actually a group of folks that run around, particularly in our finance world, they have this great t-shirt that says, no margin, no mission. So mm -hmm. they always remind us, you know, you do good um, as a company in order to be able to do good for people and the planet. Patagonia was a similar concept, do good to do good, mm -hmm. you know, and so we always think, all right, no margin, no mission, and oh, by the way, no mission, then who cares about the margin in some ways? So they go together, yeah. but it's a yes and, and you can't exactly just focus on the good without making some money. Yeah, T-shirt t-shirt worthy, no doubt. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So what is your role there? I mean, I know what it is from my perspective, but you go back to your days at Sears and then the Patagonia and, mm -hmm. and, and now, you know, it, for us as talent analytics professionals, you know, we've kind of been perceived as the data reporting folks, but right. there's so much more to not only what we do as a discipline, but what you have led a charge on. Can you share what you're doing there? At your sure. Career? And, you know, I, I have to give a lot of credit to, uh, you know, other colleagues throughout the years who have inspired me and helped guide me into what what are the best ways we can make an impact in the data analytics space? Because to be honest, I think when I started my career, it wasn't as codified a space. Mm -hmm. um, I have a background in industrial and organizational psychology. So that was my PhD coming out of school. If I had known of this thing called data science, I would have realized that's kind of what my PhD was in, but we, <laughs> we didn't really, it was right. just getting going. And so where you what you went into was selection testing or inside businesses, talent management. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've 
primarily grown up as a talent management guy overseeing you know, performance management or engagement surveys or things like the kinds of things that now have been adopted, I think rightly so, into a broader analytics mm -hmm. uh, lens. Um, so uh, it was at Patagonia, I had a similar kind of portfolio work and I was able to bring some of those skill sets and, and I oversee something similar here at Cahey. Um, broadly speaking, it's a portion of our HR functions. Um, it includes our burgeoning, we'll call it, data analytics space. In fact, it, within our within Kehi at this point, we just call it HR metrics mm -hmm. because to answer some of the questions of, of what you're getting at, where we're at right now is largely in descriptive stats and some basic reporting and you know some of the, the early stage um, pieces that we need to get in place in order to earn the right, I think, to go deeper. But we, we'll grow that into a true analytics function mm -hmm. soon enough. Mm -hmm. And then I oversee some of the um, other uh, uh, near adjacencies in HR that I think are good to own when you own analytics because they feed a lot of the, the data that you need into your system. So compensation and pay yeah. uh, is, is in my world, as well as talent management, performance management, talent development pieces. So it's a fun portfolio of work. And then, of course, I work within the broader uh, HR people operational group at uh, Kehi and, um, and serve, from a talent analytics standpoint, anyone in that group as well as the business leadership. So we've talked a lot about it, not only at this conference here, but also over the years where what's the purpose of people data and analytics in a commercial organization? What does it do? What value does it deliver? And we're talking a lot about it informing talent strategy. So right. talent acquisition, mm -hmm. internal development, how you design the organization and what the employee experience or worker experience is going to be mm -hmm. like. How do you mm -hmm. view our value in 2019 and 2020 and beyond? And a related question, how mm -hmm. do we advocate or communicate or market and sell that value internally? Because not many people grew up knowing what this is, right? Exactly, yeah. sure. And so I still think uh, a, a great place to start is with the, you know, kind of going back to the no margin, no mission concept. Um, or in a B Corp model, you think about B Corp as going after planet um, and people, but also profit. Profit mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. um, in a moment, I'll talk about how we, 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 we've added a fourth P at Kehi of purpose, which mm -hmm. you could argue blends some of the other ones, but uh, we've given ourselves permission to go beyond just profit. Yet, I think starting with profit still matters. Mm -hmm. And so the traditional way I've often started, um, and, and it resonates well for any of the financial folks um, in a room, which often are your top of house leaders, <laughs> is uh, reminding them that one of the largest line items on your SG&A line is the cost of people, right? Mm -hmm. So we can at least agree, you know, even, even before we get to employee experience and how valuable it is, uh, shouldn't we be uh, making the best decisions we can around this rather large aspect of our in cost of doing business, if you want to take it as a, uh, from a cost standpoint. So you can, my point is you can start there with almost any business leader, even if they're not going to buy into it from an employee, um, uh, you know, experience standpoint or, you know, using business for a force for good. What's so wonderful about what we're seeing with conscious capitalism, with B Corp, with um, with I mean, major companies taking the lead in in looking at uh, you know just the social good of their business is now we have permission to go beyond just the profit, right. Right? right? And so it's not about just how do I help you make better decisions to manage this cost more effectively, but um, but how can, can't we all agree that actually giving people a better experience mm -hmm. is in itself valuable. Yep. And so getting a little ahead of ourselves, but at Kehi, we do talk about a whole person experience and we care very much about that they can bring them their whole selves to work and that when they go home, we're, we're not uh, doing things at work that vastly you know, change their home life in a negative way and, and if, if anything betters their home life in their community and and that's yeah. that's its own good you know yeah. we, we get to measure that for the same thing with Patagonia they cared about for but if you have to start somewhere sure start with the profit the good news people cost yeah. a lot of money and we can probably make better decisions around people absolutely we can make better decisions one of the things that I would hope is understood broadly and that you have led a charge on through the innovations that you did throughout your career, but especially highlighted at uh, Patagonia when the, is that, forgive me, the 8090. Uh, yeah. yeah, 980 works. 980, schedule, I, yeah, I, exactly. I, forgive me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you actually hypothesized or thought about what would matter to the employee, the relationships right. at home. And you went out 
and created the measures, generated the data because you thought it mattered. Right. So that data is not in the core HR system. It's right. like, hey, we made a strategic decision that this is going to be investigated and we're going to in turn take action and then we're going to measure the effectiveness of our intervention. Can you speak to you know, how you thought about that and the, the need for new creative data? Yes, absolutely. Because I, I think, you know, it's important to note what we did with the, a change in schedule, in this case, a 980 schedule, well, that wasn't particularly a brilliant idea. I mean, it was in the ecosystem and many other companies were doing this, right? Mm -hmm. But I think where uh, Patagonia gave us permission to think a little bit differently was in how we measure the impact of it, right? And in fact, it was, it was explicitly stated up front that um, we will try, the whole idea of the 980 is you're going to work the same number of hours. You're going to try to be the same amount of product, product productive, you know, you're going to produce the same amount, but we're just going to try to create better um, employee experiences and, and kind of other good residual effects. And the benefits to the company, if you want to measure it in terms of ROI to the company, might be more in increased engagement and um, reduced turnover, et cetera. But the point is we set out just to say, can we all agree if we keep productivity the same and improve these other characteristics of the employee experience, it's a win, right? right? And so that was a fun project because you weren't having to go in there with, in some ways, even the pressure of trying to do too many things at once. Mm -hmm. um, with that lens in mind, it started leaning into the questions, well, what does that mean? What, what about the employee experience matters? And then quickly we started realizing, oh, there, there's a lot of um, work-life balance aspects of these, yeah. these schedulings that matter. We care about people getting out into the outdoors as a company, but we also just care about them as human beings and having relationships with other human beings in their life that are in the company. And so that led us down the path of saying, how do we actually build out these metrics? And to your point, you can't go to your traditional engagement survey and yeah. find things next to the items of, you know, I have the tools and resources I need to do my job and I have a better relationship with my partner. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's not there, you know? Yeah. And so we start saying, well, how do we do that? Now, fast forward ahead a little bit, we looked for some help, by the way. We didn't just do it all on our own. We had some ideas. And then we found, um, and, and I think this is just a great tactic for anyone working within a business, you look out uh, at the researchers working in this space, and we found a, a terrific, smart um, research scientist at the, at the local Channel Islands University yeah. right next to us who's doing family and work research, who wants some you know, data, right, has some time to help you analyze it, and also knows all the latest research on the questionnaires and things like that, and perfect partnership. You know, it was it was a win-win at no extra cost to them just to say, come on in, we'll we'll give you the data, you give us the time, yeah. let's let's brainstorm this together, and uh, and we we did one of the most uh, rigorous you know kind of pre-post uh, uh, studies I've done with a control group on the side, um, and and then a kind of a later you know step three post analysis, and it was it was a lot of fun to 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 see that happen. But it all started with just the philosophy that we can go beyond just the work experience. Now, if that is being authorized, I imagine it had visibility to the senior most people in the organization, not only mm -hmm. that, because it's going to have, you know, effect potentially every worker and it ended up doing so mm -hmm. in a very positive way. So you weren't mm -hmm. just guessing right. what might you know, be the response or, or the need to change. Mm -hmm. You actually were basing that in fact. So going to the actual decision making to authorize that and similar projects, mm -hmm. what does that look like for you? Because you're being tasked to, okay, I just need the reports. I got a board meeting next week. I right. get all that. But we also need to do this more investigative, you know, consultative type work. You know, how does that happen for you? Yes, exactly. And in that case, we did, uh, you know, let the uh, the leadership kind of bite off the decision in smaller chunks in the sense that we said, let's just try it out with a, it was a portion of kind of the HR organization, and we pulled in a few other folks in, in, in corporate type roles to, to try out the experience a little bit. So at least we could, you know, kind of go back to them with some um, qualitative data that said, yeah, this is meaningful to people and we don't immediately see massive concerns. We, um, we also did you know, uh, interviewing and discussions with employees moving into it. And then we, with that particular type of change, there were some legal requirements too that when you go to your hourly workforce, they had to agree to certain things. So there, were, there was some work kind of done up front to socialize and get people's head around it. Um, but again, the, the main uh, kind of sell was to say, okay, based upon what we're seeing here, we. We, we are quite confident we can improve the employee experience if you let us really go for this. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we hypothesize, based upon our early read on this, that we can keep productivity the same. Mm -hmm. 
give us a chance to go for it for six months. And yeah. so <laughs> we dove into it for a, for a period of time and yeah. did the pre post at a kind of six month intervals. Um, and, and, you know, we, we tapped into some measurements along the way to make sure we weren't, you know, needing to course correct too much. Yeah. But, um, that was one way we, we socialized it a little bit. I will say I've done other uh, sort of interventions where you, you really, you know, in an agile way build into this. This was just a little bit of socialization, a big bang yeah. with a commitment only to go a certain period of time and then yeah. we'd reevaluate. But yeah, it was, it was board level decision at that wow. point. Wow. And even at Patagonia, their big concern was we can't mess up productivity. You know, this sounds awesome, but, you know, is this really going to be something we can sustain? That's a big change. And yeah. that's what you had to prove out at the end. So. Well, stepping back, and that's a fantastic example. So here we are, as been for, you know, we're close to 2020. Yep. And oh, yeah. we're at a different time in terms of the proliferation of data, uh, the tools by which to analyze that data. Mm -hmm. We have all these disruptions that are happening, AI, globalization, mm -hmm. robotic automation, all that. So I was about to say, if you were a CHRO, but I'm going to position the question like this. As a CHRO, Whoa, Chris, okay. <laughs> <laughs> how would you address the challenges of today and tomorrow with data and analytics, like how would you want to talk to yourself and, and help you do your work? Yes, exactly. Ooh, that's a good question. And, and I love that you framed it that way because I'm realizing I have not put myself in that seat so much. You know, yeah. I think of the CHROs, my customers, uh, typically in the roles I've had alongside, um, you know, the, you know your, your CEO and board, right? Um, but if I'm the CHRO, you know, and it's helpful to flip it around, you realize, okay, what I need is some, some insights at my fingertips that can help uh, tell the stories that I need to tell uh, to help my um, CEO, board, move us in the right direction around people, right? And in the end, I, I, they're trusting me to live, eat, sleep, and breathe the experience of their people, yeah. you know, all our people. And, um, and they care about them too, but they, they're, they're trusting me to tell them when we need to course correct, when yeah. things aren't, you know, going the way they go, and also help them set a vision and a strategy to build a great organization, right? right? And so, you know, with, uh, with, I'm thinking my current company, Kahi, right, 5,000 people um, spread across the United States. We're U.S.-based primarily. We have some Canadian um, uh, locations, but it's primarily this distribution uh, center, uh, or all, the majority of people are within these distribution centers because we're a warehousing company and we have a bunch of people tr doing truck driving, yeah. you know, by the way, jobs very much in danger of automation, yeah, sure. right? Yes. I mean, big time. And, um, and so you, you're sitting there thinking, well, what will these all look like even in five years, much less 10 years from now, right? And then we have a bunch of salespeople. They, they, who knows how their jobs will change, but probably differently than some of these warehouse and, and truck driving jobs. And then you have the corporate jobs, right? So that's our population. It's not, it's not, you know, radically complex, but it's how do I help, um, you know, my CEO, my board, who, who have already said they want to do good for people, planet, and make some money, you know, as well, um, understand where we're at. And so, you know, first of all, data analytics needs to be there to give us a good view of current state and some of the trends going yeah. on. Um, but I do think with the new data available, it's even more, and with how fast things are changing, it's even more critical that we do some forecasting out in the future just to give people a realization that some of this automation, for example, mm -hmm. is five years away, you know, yep. 10 years probably yep. at the most, you know. And um, I don't think that that's as top of mind. You know, it's it's analogous to climate change in some ways. Yeah. You know, it's like if you're living on the coasts and 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 in, in climate, you know, in, in areas where the climates change a lot, you you see it. Some of us are buffered, and we just don't realize how fast it's happening. Yeah. This automation thing, man, I, you know, it's happening faster than we need. So I do think we need to point more data and analytics at that, help yeah. people sort of see a, the story of where it's going, um, and then uh, and then and then start using it as a way to measure some of the changes along the way. Yeah, well, th thank you for sharing all that. It makes me excited because I see all this stuff coming in from yeah. our <laughs> vantage point. And it's a case where we're trying to shake people and say, this is happening and you can actually do some things. And it's like, oh, we're not there yet. Um, you yeah. know, we'll get to it next year. We're implementing X system. And once we do that, I'm like, the world isn't waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have a unique perspective insofar as that. You understand the data and analytics and opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, not many HR leaders or business leaders, for that matter, you know, grew up in analytics, let alone 
right. understanding people analytics. Right. So you know, there's this education that has to happen. How does that happen in mass? How does that happen within an organization? You know, we're still figuring out one of the reasons we're at this summit. Obviously. That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So my, my point of question to you, given this, is how do we prioritize? How do we choose what we do? Like, what's the governance like there at, at KEHI? Do you facilitate a meeting of uh, HR leaders across HR functions from talent acquisition to learning and development and, and, and comp? Or is that still being, you know, created? And are those groups on the same page? You know, if not, mm -hmm. you know, is that an opportunity? Because I'm really interested. There's a lot of people chasing bright light, chasing the AI, chasing all this stuff, but we still got to do, you know, locking and tackling, still got to generate reports, but we also got to address this, not only imminent, but that current state change. So, yes, you know, exactly. prioritization is a challenge. So how do you, you know, think about that, you know, both currently and, and moving forward? That's a great question and absolutely a work in progress, something where we have opportunity to I think improved quite a bit. I've been at KHE for about six months now, so I'm still, you know, getting myself settled in and even learning all the players and the politics and all that, yeah. those kinds of things you need to be particularly effective, right? Um, and uh, and by the way, I should layer on one added piece of of KHE. It's a it's an ESOP or an employee owned company, um, which is the the, the ESOP. Um, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders, shareholders own the vast majority of the company, and then there's a few other funding sources. But it, 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 most of the people I'm trying to do good by are actually the owners. And in a sense, I, I work for them, they work for, we all work for ourselves, oh, right? right? It's an interesting dynamic. And if, it, and if you think about where are most of the people that are out in these warehouses and in these truck driving jobs, in other words, the other way to say it is the majority of my owners are in jobs that won't necessarily exist in five to ten years. Well, how do I think about wow. that, right? Wow. You know? That's, and, and so yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm kind of sitting here realizing I need to, and in fact, I'm even inspired by this idea. I'm realizing it's a little how the climate scientists, you know, are sitting out there and they're like, how do we tell people about it? Well, well, we're all in, you know, the space of people analytics. We're seeing some things happen and how do we tell people about it? The truth is what's being prioritized right now is much more near-term stuff. Mm -hmm. So right now we have some opportunities with turnover in some of our warehouses, particularly with uh, certain jobs. And we know that's a, a priority of the business leaders. Um, that's coming right out of, you know, kind of exec team level and even board level. you got to get on this and pulling to, they're, they're pulling together whole, you know, kind of committees and, and um you know, work streams around it, and therefore it's very easy for the people analysts just to plug in and be a, a helpful, yep. you know, tool within their broader mission. So that's easy, but I think what's tricky is you're, you're, t you're describing a good question around how do you balance the immediate fire, literally, yep. going on that you absolutely have to be part of, that's a good example, with the realization that uh, we're in a unique place to get out ahead of current state yep. and help people see that. Yeah. So where I have work in progress, and you've inspired me a little bit in <laughs> having to sit up here and say that I, I don't have this all figured out, is, um, is absolutely going back and thinking about how I can pull together, I think, a little bit more of that working leadership group within HR. Mm -hmm. We are also, and I, I think this is true of many of the colleagues I work with in people analytics, is we're, we also are made sure we're plugged into the, the core kind of business intelligence community of practice at KHE. And so I have yeah. someone on my team who goes and sits on their regular meetings. Yeah. And so that's another opportunity to both learn but influence yep. and, um, and make sure that, you know, we we're suggesting they start looking into the future. And as they look into the future, it, it opens up the chance for us to ask the question of, well, what is the people part of your right. future question? Right. And let, let me help inform that. But I think where I need to move next is, is getting some coalescing around prioritization within HR beyond current fires. Well, it, it's such an exciting opportunity, right? Because we have these data and systems that now can analyze the employee experience, the candidate experience. We just have better visibility into what's going on and what might right. happen and all that, yep. which is great, but it doesn't have an audience to affect appropriate change and it's of marginal value. It remains esoteric. Yep. What I would like to go deeper on is something that you alluded to, and I got a chill when you said it. Your owners are mm -hmm. your customers. Mm -hmm. your, your decisions and what you do is going to impact them over time. Their jobs are changing. Mm -hmm. So how are you then helping them change in accordance with where the business is going? Exactly. So it's not right. kind of a, a separation like it is in most organizations. It's like, 
you're an owner, you have a stake in the company, literally. literally. And if you're going to be contributing five plus years from now, you are going to have to adapt. So how are we going to help facilitate you adapting? So it's now no longer an aha in our space, whether it be right. talent or, or, or right. people analytics, is that skill taxonomy, skill development, uh, reframing work from these jobs which are static to actual task level or project level um, you know, buckets. So maybe a lot of those tasks or projects are going to go by the wayside, get exactly. automated, and yeah. then there's these piece of work that's going to remain and this new piece of work that's going to develop. Right. Exactly. So, so, yep. so the pointed question again is, are you, you know, setting the stage for that discussion and, and do that type of work and leveraging not only internal data sources but external data sources? I mean, what, what's your view on how your work is going to look 12, 24 months from now? Right, and, and, and at, at most right now we are setting the stage, but that's a great place for analytics to begin, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just even showcasing current state. Um, you know, we, we have data in our systems that go back at least a dozen years, so you can you can at least go back. And, and some of the early work we we started to dabble in is just say, are there some success stories of people who have we can show have started in these jobs and you know kind of yeah. moved into materially different or meaningfully different types of work. Okay, so the, here's some paths that might make some sense. So we're we're just in the early stages of trying to map out possible paths out of what what essentially would be kind of entry level work within a warehouse or so. And in fact, by the way, the driver job is a little bit higher level, higher skilled job. Now it may get automated in its own way, but currently it's it's viewed as a path up and out of a warehouse type job. Oh. So um, some of the work, in fact, that predates me, no credit for this, is is, um, is in fact uh, trying to hire more internal drivers from these kind of warehouse jobs and, mm -hmm. you know, connecting. So early stages, in other words, is just to tell the story of some what's working where's some success. I think quickly what's forming as well, though, is the picture of how little people have mobility out of these jobs. Yeah. So unfortunately, the success is still the exception, not yeah. the rule, right? right? And how do we even start helping people get their head around the fact that, um, okay, again, kind of what we just said, the facts are the facts. Most of my owners work in jobs that are changing significantly, and most of the people who work in those jobs don't move out of those jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, even just stop there. Do we care? What are we yeah. going to do about it? You know, right. so, so we're starting to try to get that level of conversation going um, through some data and analytics at the you know the leadership levels and within HR, um, the uh, I think equally important and uh, some work I'm very excited about being part of with uh, colleagues that uh, that have, uh, that were participating with this conference and in, in discussions around is is even just getting some clarity and and some standardization around what do we mean by helping people have mobility out of some of these jobs? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work I did at Patagonia and even here when I kind of start here with as B Corp, and, and a lot of what B Corp points you to, let's face it, is focusing a lot on uh, livable wages, making sure at least the jobs, whatever they pay, aren't you know falling too far below a livable wage. And I think that's a very important question, but that's not the same as a, mob a mobility question. Yep. And, um, and you know, we could pay people a couple more dollars an hour, and they're still, in a sense, kind of stuck in a, in a class of work mm -hmm. that itself is, you know... Um, susceptible to automation, and and if it is automated, it doesn't mean they have any more skills that lets them go on and do something different. And so mm -hmm. I think the answer to some of these mobility metrics, if we as we talk about it, will be looking at can people not just make a few dollars more or make a slight promotion from, say, the entry-level warehouse job to the slightly better warehouse job also that will get automated, but, um, but can they find ways to grow skills well in this situation to move into management position perhaps, move into something completely different, or to your point, start being ready for whatever these new jobs we design, which mm -hmm. might be part of the solution, sure. that are still there in the warehouse. Yeah. But they, they, they take skills that took uh, longer to kind of develop and grow. Therefore, these folks actually get paid more because yeah. there's... You know, the whole key to getting paid more, I always tell people, is you just have to be good at something that not all that many other people are good at. It's I, a supply and demand problem. Sure. The problem with these warehouse jobs is, um, well, it's a, it's a tight labor market. There's still a lot of people who are capable of doing the basic stuff right away. Yeah. So how do I help people be capable of stuff that not everyone's capable of doing? Yeah. That's mobility. So, yeah. And related to what you were just saying, historically there's been this 
fear that if I'm going to invest in my warehouse workers, my my drivers, and make them right. better, that they're going to bail, go to our competitors, and there's that's a very scarcity mindset, my mentality. It's I'm a good way of saying it. Lose my event or mm -hmm. my investment. Uh, increasingly, though, people, particularly young people, are joining organizations. Research is showing that. I am believing that that is going to help me advance my career, mm -hmm. both within that organization or out, because of the work experience, the educational opportunities within that. So is that the way you're looking at it? It's like, hey, you come in here, your economic mobility, your ability to move up might not only be within this organization, it might be elsewhere. Absolutely. and and. You know, that's the thing that I, I, I don't know why I didn't see it as clearly up until a few years ago, but as I, I, I kept digging into data and engagement surveys, for example, and they would, um, you know, anytime somebody would say, well, I need more learning and development, you'd kind of dig in, you'd think, okay, how do I help them with that? And oftentimes I've owned the learning and development function, as, and I do at Kehi. You, you figure it's more training or something like that. When you dig in more and, and do interviews with people and keep digging in, you realize, I, I, the majority of the time I'm starting to realize is they're, they're confounding that, and probably rightly so, with career development. They really mean, I want to get to the next bigger thing. I want to do more meaningful work. I want to be more valuable. And I want to get paid more and yeah. get promoted and all those kinds of things. And, um, and so increasingly, I, I, and, I, and this is a little bit anecdotal, but it, it feels as though increasingly the ability to help people truly grow their careers and grow their value is one of the most meaningful benefits you can give people, right? Yeah. And to your point, it, if you're in a scarcity mindset, you start thinking, okay, well, I'll pull them in and they'll grow fast with me and then other people just pluck them off. You have to break yourself of that and it's counterintuitive, but the truth is they're going to stick with you because they're growing faster with you than somewhere else. Yeah. And yes, maybe some of them move off and go somewhere else, but they, they stuck with you longer, you know? Mm -hmm. And so even as a direct manager of people on my teams, I've often said, look, Call me out on this. I'm going to try to grow your career faster than anyone else can as you work under me. Whenever that stops, you should leave. Like, yeah. a, I can't blame you, but I'm going to, I'm going to assume I'm going to make you more valuable, but in a counterintuitive way, I'm going to assume that's what's going to cause you to stick with me. And you know what? We're going to have a lot more fun and do a lot more great things yeah. anyway if we Absolutely. have this abundance mindset instead of the scarcity mindset. So, yes, we're trying to kind of flip that around and say, uh, let's, let's, move forward that. And, you know, maybe I'm giving too specific a shout out to another company, but a very large kind of retail big box company mm -hmm. um, has been, you know, inspired me with doing some of these, uh, these kinds of ideas of how do you help people um, gain an education for jobs that aren't the jobs they're working on today at all, may never be the jobs they, that the same company even hires them for. And maybe other people come and pick them off, yeah. but they're going to do it, A, because it's the right thing to do, and B, it turns out it's leading towards better retention anyway. So Yeah, so yeah, well, why not? It takes why belief, not? and obviously data yeah. can support that, hey, right. that, that did that wasn't as painful. That was a myth, right. in fact. Right. You know, we actually had good financial results and customer satisfaction, all those good things. So a couple more things I want to touch on before we, we wrap here. If someone, business leader, CHRO, you know, leader in HR or talent is listening to us and say, like, okay, they've been talking, you know, Chris is an expert in people analysts. They haven't even talked about AI really in, right. in, in, in HR. So it, I'm going to frame the question this way. Is AI something that is a big distraction or is it something that integral to your thinking around, um, you know, HR innovation mm -hmm. and, and people analytics or is it more of a means to an end? So I'm going to find a problem, and there, you know, AI might emerge as a potential solution. How do you think about right, AI right. in HR? Yeah, you know, sometimes my first reaction to it is it's such a big term, right? And all yeah. it comes to sort of like somebody saying, "Let's improve leadership at the company," <laughs> and you're kind of like, "All right, well, that's a large term. <laughs> Who? What do we mean?" You know. Yeah. Um, uh, let's improve even engagement, by the way. It's got a loaded broad term, right? Um, but you can't not be thinking about AI. So first off, AI is, uh, in particular domains, is, is the reason um, jobs are being disrupted. So you have mm -hmm. to watch what it's doing on the, the work side of the equation, right, mm -hmm. before we even use it for people analytics on, on ourselves. And so you're, you're paying attention to how the uh, the techniques are growing and changing and disrupting the work itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the domain I care about. 
and how will it, it also disrupt the interface between humans at work. Um, within the HR space, you know, I think it, it's, you, you pick and choose certain techniques that are valuable. I think it does have the danger to be a distraction. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. It's, um, I, I think actually that's true of all kind of people analytics. There's this danger of, you, of, of getting enamored by, you know, the, the $10 analytical technique when the 10 cent version worked great, right? right? Yeah. Or, or especially when you're using it to sell past the close, you know, with a decision, you know. And so, um, so oftentimes with my own, you know, analytics team, I'm always sort of saying, okay, in the background, let's use whatever techniques we need to feel like we truly did come to an answer that had, you know, some statistical significance, some real meaningful pieces. And then let's separate that almost entirely from how we sell it. Yeah, yeah. And so if AI is needed to get to that answer, great. Um, every once in a while, maybe AI is needed to sell the answer, yeah, right. you know, to be able to go yeah. and say, hey, we use some, you know, we, we either incorporate AI in, um, you know, <laughs> I was thinking on the talent acquisition side is being disrupted with by some AI with chatbots and yeah, these sure. kinds of things. And so um, it, that, that people can get their head around it quick. They get excited about it. Mm -hmm. You know, then we then we go off and we say, okay, yeah, we used a chatbot to, to gather some information from, you know, this prospective hiring group. And oh, by the way, we're also going to come over and do some text analytics on, mm -hmm. you know, what's the sentiment of these groups as they're coming in and how do they differ and you know, by the way, maybe we can get a sense of whether chatbots are better. You know, saying a, the word AI gets people's attention. So yeah, yeah. that's good. But I, I think uh, the, the quick answer to your question is absolutely paying attention to it, looking for opportunities to use it, um, both in terms of techniques as well as to sell it. But um, broadly speaking, trying not to get overly distracted by it when the 10 cent answer works just fine. Yeah, well, absolutely well said. And one of the places AI is emerging is in what we talked about earlier around bringing the whole self to work, which can be translated yeah. in many organizations to diversity, inclusion, yeah. and yeah. the sense of belonging. Yeah. So you, what are your thoughts and ideas in that area when we talk about how analytics can play a role in sh not only shedding light on those themes, but helping yeah. improve them? Oh, I think that's so good. And I, again, the, the um, kind of back to this theme of what's great about working for companies that care about more than just the bottom line profit is, is you can go back to your old techniques of selling it through profit because they still care about profit, but you have permission to go beyond that and have other reasons why it would be good to, to do these interventions in the world just for their own sake. And for Kehi, um, improving the experience of someone's entire whole self at work and then at home and in their community is meaningful to us. So we would actually probably be able to sell an intervention that supported people's mobility in our warehouse locations on literally the basis that it's part of serving the communities we're in. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of companies are starting to move that way, that, that kind of mindset starting to gain. And so, so we do care about it. It does demand from an analytics standpoint, then you start thinking about, okay, well, what about, um, what kind of data do I need to gather to support this broader perspective when I was just used to worrying about their performance in their job and maybe their engagement around their job? Um, which, is, as some would say, is just a very extractive mindset, right? <laughs> what can I get out of these people? Okay, if I'm starting to measure what am I putting into them, themselves, their whole selves, their families, their communities, well, I mean, first of all, you start going, look at all your current measures, you know, does your engagement survey or whatever pulses you're doing look at more than just their experience at work? Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair question. And then now, even more so, we've already, in people analytics for a while, worried about macro uh, trends, um, you know, kind of outside data around hiring, um, you know, the, the marketplace, uh, you know, workforce trends, all those kinds of things. We care about that. Well, well, for the first time, though, you start thinking about, well, if I care about the community, you know, beyond these people, well, what kind of information can I gather about these communities? Mm -hmm. And if I take interventions within my company around education, let's say, and mobility, um, might be interesting to see what that does to the broader communities right. that I'm in. A lot of places we're in are in, um, you know, not uh, they're they're not like the highest um, standards of living type communities, which right. is why people are working in the warehouse right. jobs. And so, it's a wonderful opportunity to make a bigger impact than just your employee base. Um, we are not there. Is my my key point. I, uh, I don't feel like I have great, you know, kind of outside external market data or community based data on these things. All I'm saying is. It's good to challenge yourself to think beyond the traditional metrics. Well, I, you know, as we start to wrap up, I, I mean, that theme I cannot celebrate, amplify any higher because the fact that we as 
whether it be business leaders, HR leaders, people analytics leaders, historically, people analytics leaders have been customers of the data within their system. Right. Right. You right. Know, it's just like the HR system was selected, ATS was selected, learning was selected, there's data being popped out. We're going to supposed to do some magic to answer the questions leaders want or, or need right. to know. Now, increasingly, we're getting visibility into those questions and sometimes mm -hmm. not only being attentive to what's being asked, but attentive to what's not being asked that mm -hmm. should be asked mm -hmm. because we have visibility into not only the data and tools within our system, but outside you know, our system, and that then right. creates all these new possibilities, but it also, to our earlier discussion, creates a whole heck of a lot of work, and, and does. You know, where does it you know, fit in? So yeah, again, as we wrap, you know, any final words for any advice around how to not only stand up but people on those capabilities? I think right. most, is, most organizations say, I, I get it. We need reports. We need to be right. you know, researching, but you know, what are two or three of the things that, okay, if you're going to mandate that we do this, you know, what needs to be in place from, from your perspective? Yeah, that's a great way of framing it. So I think, again, I'm just inspired by this idea of, okay, you got you to start somewhere and, and, and where kind of your core expertise are and where, where people are asking for people analytics already. And a lot of that may be around some of the traditional things of productivity and performance and leading to profit and yeah. ROI and those kinds of things. And you, you start there, right? But just continually reminding yourself that it's okay to look bigger than that yeah. and think about the impact of uh, what's coming in the future, so bigger in terms of you know um, time frame, as well as bigger in terms of, well, how does this all kind of coalesce to affect the planet and the people experience, et cetera. And when I'm thinking about people, can I think about more than just their sliver of experience at work? What about the whole person? You know, what about them as a, as a you know, physical being and, and health and wellness as a, as a spiritual being, you know, like yeah. if they, if they want to bring that to work, what does that mean? What does that mean in their communities? Uh, you know, as a, you know, as, as somebody who cares about their, their skills and, you know, meaningful work, you know, what does that mean? So just asking those bigger questions and then challenging yourself and the, uh, somebody else gave me this advice, just find one metric that even if your business leaders aren't asking for it, you know, sneak that onto your slide at the yeah. bottom, you know, yeah. and just say, oh, by the way, the, <laughs> turns out, you know, this led to this ROI, blah, 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 if that's what they want to know. And uh, we found out that people expressed that they were, you know, uh, had better relationships with their family as a result. Well, that's, how'd you even look at that? You know, yeah. so you're just trying to kind of pepper in things if that's the only place you can start. It's bigger than the core. You know, oh, God. Now I'm getting, it's a fantastic idea. It's like, that's somewhere where like on base percentage came from, you know, money ball. It's like, that that's was not the, that was not the exactly. standard baseball card metric. It, it, was, great... it was discovered. So, mm -hmm. and then it was socialized. So Chris, it's yeah. always a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for sharing. Likewise. And yeah, do it again, sir. I love being part of the journey with you on this and, and to everyone else in this community, very grateful for their influence and their inspiration. So just glad to be on the ride. All right, likewise. Yeah.